we want to talk about the positives of the young black male. And just to say the word, the campaign for black male achievement says it all. To support black male achievement, um, we can't uh, allow the complexity of the issues that disproportionately affect communities of color and black men and boys specifically to serve as an excuse not to act. We, we have to act now. We have to decide if we want black male achievement to be an expense or an investment. If you start thinking about black male achievement and you take any one metric and you just start talking about the metric of today without really talking about how we got there and some of the things uh, and some of the system failures that we've had uh, leading up to now, I think you're missing the context that really helps bring everybody to the table at the same place. Well, a big piece is reminding ourselves that we didn't get here by accident, that it was, you know, centuries, but very specifically almost a century of very specific policies related to housing and employment and education and health care that created neighborhoods where it's almost impossible for people who grow up and live in them and want to turn them around to do so. There's a reason that every major city in the United States has uh, racial identities within the neighborhoods. It's, it's, it, it wasn't by choice, it was because of things like redlining, uh, things that were actually condoned by the government, by the city, state, and federal government. So uh, we have, it wasn't a natural occurrence. So we have to understand that and realize that that is the reason we have a lot of the problems that we have right now and try to, try to resolve those things. to understand uh, what created a mountain, what created a valley, um, why the vegetation is like it is. And uh, so we have to get beneath that and we have means to do that in map making. We have to do the same thing in this society. That's more important now uh, than ever before. The business for me is a means to an end. I spend a great deal of time here at the business, but I spend an even greater amount of time out in the community, particularly helping uh, youth. I walked through the halls of Roosevelt Perry for just 30 minutes yesterday, just meeting, greeting uh, teachers and staff, and more importantly, kids. And I can easily say uh, it was the most important 30 minutes of my day. Uh, my wife and I have been somewhat successful. We always discuss what can we do to uh, enhance the li lives of other people. So we wanted to think of some kind of way that we could leave a legacy. We wanted to first recognize our alma mater, and we always looked to help the local charities, and we wanted to step it up and do some more for that. Being able to go out and help others, and to me, that's the, uh, that's the, the richness of life. If you can imagine K through 12, and we have uh, speckles of greatness here, but the focus of our uh, of the culture from which you the genesis from which you come from starts at slavery, and then you compile that with what the media is saying about us, which is uh, halfway inaccurate, if not more. Um, so there becomes be there becomes this notion and this internal angst that black males begin to have, and they, if not careful, they begin to see themselves as to uh, what is proliferated. What are the real stories going on there? It's not the stories about crime or a lack of opportunity. It's young mothers raising their families, like all mothers, with a lot of challenges ahead. It's fathers trying to make a difference in their own neighborhoods. And we deliberately don't tell those stories. We filter them out. You can't get the press to West Louisville to tell some of those stories, but they're happening. It's like a game of Monopoly, except our white counterparts, and they had a 400-year head start. It takes some sensitivity and it, it takes us acknowledging the, the fact that black people haven't had it the best in the United States and um, it's gonna take local leaders and national leaders to, to make some changes. We can't change what we don't address. So it's all about getting it out there, having open and candid conversations. We, we're all in this together and we need, um, we need to support each other. And as a society, we have to understand that those barriers exist. We can't just write things off as bad luck or as poor work ethic. You know, there's just too many data points showing 
that historically, the opportunities for black and brown males in particular have not been the same as any other peer group. Any young man that's going to come to Du Bois Academy will be taught that he can be whatever he wants to be, but as their leader, it's my job to also push back against others and say, in, in order for them to be what they need to be, then as a society, we all need to be what we need to be for those young men too, and to support them and not to fall victim to false narratives. When you think about who we are and what we do, uh, we are fathers, uh, we are uncles, we're coaches, we're mentors. It's just that sometimes the way we do it is not the traditional way. Uh, when you go into African-American barbershop, the love and the surrounding that those young men get when they're there is another place that we choose not to elevate and choose not to highlight. But then also when you think about our churches and our faith houses of faith, there's men there all the time supporting young men and thinking about our young men. So I just think, you know, we never tell the full story. So how do we redefine what fatherhood looks like and means, right? I think we are focused in on the two-parent family where the father's in the house, the mom's in the house, and that's not the, the norm anywhere. So when we think about where fathers show up, we've got to really start understanding that just because a father's not in the household does not mean he's not a part of that kid's life. Folks really want to have a narrative about who we are and what we do and, and control that narrative uh, for their own personal gain and own personal uh, benefit, right? And I think if you are saying that black men and boys are doing well, then you stop building jails and people stop making money. We've got to start owning our own story and telling our own story as well, using the different platforms that are available to us now to really push out the narratives that are really taking place in our communities. I love to ground conversations in data because I feel like it's the best way to be really objective. Driving just 30 minutes across our community, you will see a 12 to 13 year life expectancy difference. That meaning that black men, um, black individuals in our community, individuals who are growing up in concentrated neighborhoods of poverty, um, they may live 13 years um, shorter lives than those growing up in East Louisville that are more predominantly Caucasian or white. We know that in Louisville, um, over half of the homicides in our city um, are, are people under the age of 25. Um, and we know that the majority of shootings, um, the majority of homicides, the victims, the people that we're losing are uh, African-American males. And we have to change the narrative um, around, um, around that loss. The moral imperative of, ins of ensuring that where you grow up should not dictate you living 12 years shorter, um, that, that should stir something in us from a moral and ethical perspective but also the reality that if we address those economic disparities, that we increase the, the financial mobility of our, of our entire city by several hundred million dollars. My mother and father were uh, disabled when I was a kid. Started working at 12 years old, washing cars, cutting grass, babysitting. I would sell gardening seeds in the summertime to people. It was weird because my father was a preacher and we didn't have much at all but it seemed like he was always helping people. And one of the things he told me when I was a kid, he said, if nobody will hire you, hire yourself, which is basically like there's no excuse for you not to work. Christmases came and went without Christmas presents, but we were never upset about it because that was just stuff. And we know how, what we knew for sure was that my parents loved us um, and they would do what they could. There were times when I had to wear my sister's shoes to school and I would cover them up with my jeans. And so my attitude was that you only gonna joke on me once. For as smart as I may have been, for as, as good as my grades were, I was told by my counselors that you either go into the military or you'll probably end up in jail or dead. Well, first of all, I credit God for it, the path that he put me on, obviously, and then just having the Air Force to give me a skill. Like, I mean, I learned electronics in the Air Force. The, the person that left the military is the person that, um, that you see now. For me, I know my place now, I know where, what, 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 my, what my job is, what my, my path is. My path is to serve. The military gave me so much in terms of training, in terms of you know, experience. I've traveled all, literally all over the world. I grew up in Gary, Indiana in the projects, and so I had this small circle that I lived in, right? And all I knew was what was, what, what was in that circle. When I went into the Air Force, that circle, I mean, like, just went crazy wide. It's what I see in my kids and, these, and the young people that we serve now. 
is that once you give them the resources, once you show them what they can be, then they become confident enough to not to worry about what other people think. One of the first things I say to them is I love you. And I say that with no reservations whatsoever. I love you, I care about you, and I care about your future. It's important to me that you succeed. The words that always come to mind are weaving and fabric. I feel like we are like this ultimate fabric that has the opportunity to bind a lot of these black male achievement efforts together. Well, we need only to look at what happens if we help the least of these in our society, you know? It's very difficult to have aspirations and, and build upwards if we don't have a foundation that's, you know, sturdy. We're all products of all of these things that we're brought from. Uh, and so your neighborhood that you're brought from, your family dynamic that you're brought from, whether your parents value education, all of those things make part and parcel of who the human beings are that we all interact with every day. The idea is we're not that different. We're not that far apart. It can seem like it on a daily basis, but when you just take a few steps outside of yourself and outside of your normal realm of things that you care about, if you really take a look at that, I think the impact could be transformational. I talked to this group this morning, and there was four young men in that group of 16 that had 4.0 GPAs. And one of them just told me, I missed four, I missed four years of school because my father um, had issues and nobody just sent me to school. I said, that is amazing. You missed four years of school and you were able to pick yourself up. I said, I love you, you are amazing. He said, I said, when is the last time you've heard that? He said, when I was five. How does a 16 year old not here, I love you. You are amazing. In 11 years, and be his best. How does that happen? Super Chef started in like a, a weird place. And it's funny because it grew in a weird place too. It started from, I guess, saying yes to all the things I would normally say no to. <laughs> You know, being a dishwasher and a line cook when we first started. You know, like, that's how Super Chef started, by just like being on our knees and then eventually being uh, raised up to the position we're in today. Cooking is one aspect of who I am. You know, like, it can come and go tomorrow. I know that my food is my connecting piece with people. I don't see a lot of people who think like I do, so therefore I, I doubt myself at times to say, Am I different? Am I okay? You know, like, is it okay to still be happy in the middle of this situation or to still see the positive and every negative? Like, is that normal? My way of thinking and the positivity of just feeding yourself what you want out of life instead of for what you got out of life can take you to anywhere you want to go in the world. A lot of things I had to learn on my own, and it's hard. It's nothing worse than having to learn everything on your own. For me, it's so important to have people who are better than you, people who know more than you, people who do more than you, people who you want to be like in some way, shape, or form to be around you. Most people don't understand that people you hang around, the people you have around you, are one of the most important decisions you're ever going to make in your life. You know what I'm saying? That is, you are the sum of the five friends that you hang with. First of all, you got to tell kids what success looks like. It looks like doing what you say you're going to do first. That's the first part of success. You know, and it comes by showing them an example of someone living it and not someone doing it. Like what I had with Derek Anderson. I had someone who didn't tell me what to do. He showed me what to do. That's how you plant the seeds that grow into men understanding what they can do and how powerful they are. Because the only difference between success and failure is the right belief system in yourself. That's it. I want to be remembered not only for food, but for how I use food, like how Mom and I use boxing. Boxing is his gift, but he used that to connect with people. I want to use food to connect with people. And I also want people to know I think I'm pretty as well. <laughs> you know, so. A big part of the Black Male Achievement Initiative really is to create a network for people. Everybody's life is easier when they have a network. Well, I think the Black Male Achievers has it right. You know, I think that bringing successful Black men around young, the youth is the start of it all. You know, you can only dream as much as you've almost seen to an extent. So if your community is all you know, someone needs to take you out your community to show you what life is like outside your community. Martin Luther King Jr.'s favorite song was, if I can help somebody along the way, then my living shall not be in vain. And uh, I love that song and I love that simple phrase, if I can help somebody else out, then my living shall not be in vain. 
people can coalesce around pointing fingers at a single person or a single group, but it takes a lot of hands to, to move a movement along and to change legislation inevitably, and that is what the end game should be. When you think you have nothing and you have nothing to give, that's, that's absolutely not true. I tell my students this all the time, is that um, you don't have to have a lot of money. Money's not really the thing anyway. The biggest thing that I can tell folks is if you want to make a change, you have to know why you want to make the change and you have to know what you're fighting for. And the only way you can do those two things is to engage in the work. We're all one community. And so to the extent that any segment of our community feels that they are less than part of all of us or that they're treated any differently in our system of justice, it is an issue for everyone. I've said before, for there to be peace, in a community, there has to be a feeling that there's justice. You know, my thing to the five-year-old in kindergarten, for me, if I'm talking to him, is really that I love you, I got you, and we're creating a better future for you. Well, personally, I see myself in this work. Um, you know, I see my siblings, my brothers in this work, my father, my uncles, you know, I see them in this work. And so it's a labor of love. It's um, not a naivete about how challenging the work can be and how embedded these systems are. Um, but I think it's a faith in my community and my partners and uh, the individuals who have committed their lives to this work as well. I believe in us um, and I believe in our community. We need a multiracial, multigender coalition of, of, of people who, who care about people. This is how we live united.